Rebecca is Beth Edney, and she's from Ontario, Canada. I heard a talk, I think it was last year, for the Perennial Plant Symposium, and boy, oh boy, she's amazing. She's awesome. And that's why I invited her. That's why I invited her to come here today to talk to you as well. Now, Beth is a certified landscape designer, and with over 25 years' experience in landscape design, her work has been published in Gardening Life, Canadian Gardening, Chantelaine Horticul Horticultural, um, Horticultural Review, Reader's Digest, Metro News, the Toronto Star, that's one of the most important newspapers in Canada, the, the Toronto Sun, Canadian Living, and the Globe and Mail. Her work has been seen on HGTV, the W Network, and City TV. Her work has also been published in trade catalogs. And Beth has been, sorry, Beth has built several award-winning gardens at Canada Blooms. That's Canada's premier, premier flower and garden show, including Judge's Choice and People's Choice for her Disney Garden. She has also won awards of excellence for her residential designs. Beth is very active in her industry. She served as chair of the Landscape Designer Group of Ontario for five years during her term. She created the Landscape Designer Conference. Beth has been active on the show committee at La Landscape Ontario since 2001. She's currently serving as a chair. She also sits on the board of directors for Landscape Ontario and the Toronto Botanical Gardens, which is, which is really something you, you got to see. Beth has also chaired a committee to advise the provincial government for the horticulture apprenticeship program. She runs Designs by the Yard. Actually, you can Google and you can have a Facebook page as well on that. I mean, they can be your friend, right? Yep. That, that's what I've done. She runs Designs by the Yard, Designs um, Studio and Boutique on Annette Street in Toronto. The studio specializing in urban gardens in the Toronto area and the boutique offers garden furniture, unique water features, art, and accessories. Beth teaches part-time at Humber College, Niagara Falls, School of Horticulture. Uh, Nether College, what is it, how do you say it again? Is it Fanshawe? Fanshawe, Fanshawe College, and at Landscape Ontario. She's also an active member at a church. In her spare time, Beth raises three, three children, and one of them is here today, in the front here. <laughs> Can you raise your hand and stand up? There he, there he is, yeah. <laughs> And she has recently added Hockey Mom to your resume. <laughs> Beth is also pr proud of her collaboration with other members of Landscape Ontario to produce beautiful gifts, such as Rachel's Butterfly Garden for the Make-A-Wish Foundation and the Rooftop Garden at Sick Kids Hospital for the Starlight Foundation. And she came here yesterday all the way from Ontario, Canada. I'll give her a big round of applause, please. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm thrilled to be here. I've never been anywhere near Kansas, so I was really, really excited. And when, uh, like I said, I, uh, offered me to come, I was super excited. When it was confirmed, I was, I've been, I've been just talking about it ever since. So it's like, oh, my friends are all really tired of me talking about coming here, but they'll all want to know what I've seen while I was here. So I'm super passionate about landscape design, actually anything design. I'm like crazy about it. I was in your gift shop downstairs buying up the store, so if you want something, you better get down there before I get back down there. <laughs> um, so we're gonna, I've got a jam-packed session here, so I wanna get started on it. So I get excited when I get clients that call me up and they say that they just have a postage stamp of, of a property, and I start to literally drool. <laughs> Most people think, oh, a small property. I have a, a friend. He designs um, properties for movie stars and uh, sports hall of famers. And his projects are these huge acreages and just gobs and gobs and gobs of money just thrown at these projects. And they're beautiful, don't get me wrong. But I love these little spaces because I think you have to be super creative with little spaces because every little inch makes a big difference. You know, if, if you're three inches off, sometimes things don't work, sometimes things don't fit. And often with small spaces, well, sometimes in the city we have some money to deal with because, you know, Trontonians, there's some wealthy Trontonians. But sometimes those small spaces are also on a limited budget. So I have a lot of fun with them. And uh, so I just throw, threw this up here and I actually have an after of this. This is not mine. This is actually from uh, the website. But I, we're going to talk about some of the ideas of why this works. So I just want you to quickly take a look at this because we're going to come back to it and hopefully you'll be able to come back to me with what, what ideas there work in the small space. And by the way, now I always tell my clients um, before that they have to take their drapes down because <laughs> it makes a better before picture. Uh, so Rita talked a ton about containers, so I'm going to skip through it a little quickly because I've got lots more to talk about. But really, in small spaces, containers are huge. You can make really big impacts with containers, and you can make some, um, some do some neat tricks. I learned this by accident. 
um, taking a little um, tchotchka, <laughs> a little figurine that uh, a family member gave me. And I'm not really big on those little figurines, and so I kind of stuck it in my garden and forgot about it. And then one day I was throwing together containers, and I threw up this little statue in a container. And all of a sudden it has presents, right? That little you know, statuary on its own in the garden was doing nothing, it was lost, no one even noticed it, it was kind of just overgrown. But by putting it up in a container, really gives it presence and, and kind of fun, and, and that's a way to put some personality into a container in your garden. Uh, this one here, I don't know if you find this, but containers in Toronto, we, are, we have gone tropical. Uh, we're tropical crazy, so we're all buying lots and lots of foliages now for our containers in Toronto. I always say with containers, it's funny because you think small spaces, you need to go small containers. I actually go the opposite. Go big or go home. A lot of my clients tend to be you know, workaholics or they're busy and they're not totally into gardening. And so I tell them to buy the bigger the better, the biggest they can afford. It's going to make the biggest impression as well. And, and maybe less is more in that case. And this is a really nice grouping. Um, and here, you probably, this is a glazed, glazed planters. Do you guys? Can you get them here? Yeah. Do, can you get the inside glazed? You should look for that because actually it'll stand up better to your weather conditions. Um, by being glazed on both sides, the water can't get in. And what, you know what happens when water gets in and freezes and cracks, right? It expands and cracks and off it goes. So glazed containers are expensive because a lot of them are coming from overseas. And so you're paying mostly for the shipping. So if you are going to get glazed ones, get the double glazed if you can find them. There's just another. Big, huge planter. Uh, this is actually from the Atlanta Botanical Gardens. Were you there? And I, I pulled this one out because I think it's important in small spaces too, is to maybe, like, what, what plays the starring role in this? Is it the containers? No, right? The containers just kind of are just there. It's more the plants that are in it. And I think we're all crazy about plants, and we want to make a statement with the plants. So sometimes it's nice to do a whole collection of the same pots in a small space, because it'll make a bigger impression. I'm absolutely crazy about succulents in containers. I think they're fabulous, and they're super easy to look after. You almost can kind of forget about them. As long as you put them in a really well-drained container, they um, can really thrive. This is from Longwood. Has anybody been to Longwood, Pennsylvania? Yeah. Even my husband wanted to go back for another day. I was like, almost fell off my chair that night when he said, yeah, I want to go back. But it is a fabulous place. So you have to make plans on your bucket list if you haven't gone to Longwood. It's in Pennsylvania to see the gardens there. But this is actually some, these are hanging baskets. And what I love about these hanging baskets is they can almost become columns. Like this whole idea, you know, you could create a really neat entrance in a small space with some hanging baskets. This is actually from one of my display gardens at Canada Blooms. And I always do funky things in containers. And so I, I showed you about you know, putting a figurine in. Here I've put a glass vase in and, and stuck in actually some papyrus leaves. And I put in um, some hookerella at the bottom. And I love foliages in containers. And I know Rita talked a ton about that. And I concur, absolutely. But you know, these are the things we can do in little gardens that are kind of lost in a big garden, right? If you put a little pumpkin arrangement in the little garden, it would be absolutely lost and you'd never be able to appreciate it. But you can do these kind of things in little tiny spaces and people notice them. This is actually one of my clients. She's crazy about pink and purples. And so, you know, it's bringing that personality to, you know, with your clients or your homeowners um, and, and putting their personality and their stamp onto anything you put in the garden. This is actually our place, eh? Well, aren't you glad I didn't bring up the one with the picture of you? <laughs> There's about three in this picture. Fortunately, I didn't take a picture when this was fully grown, but the, the, the vine was it fully gone across the walkway um, at the end of the season. And so I just rigged it up. I put these, these actually planters are huge. They're about five feet tall. And I did a false bottom to them and ran an arch, a wire um, arch in it. And then I created a really kind of funky archway. Don't look at my terrible landscaping behind. <laughs> One of those ones with the shoe without, the shoemaker without the shoes. Um, planters raised up. What does that do in a small space? It gives us more real estate. How can you not beat that? So, you know, putting planters on some neat stands um, helps them grow better, but it also gives you lots of room to grow below. There's another picture of succulents. 
have to show you this picture. This is actually just from the internet. Um, but I love the color continuum with this. You've got the juxtaposition between that green pot and then the reds. And the red is in all the plants. So the form, does anybody use formium in containers in the summer? Try it. It's a fabulous, really easy plant. It's from New Zealand. They actually grow as weeds on the side of the road there. And if you get a gallon container pot, by the end of the season, it'll be twice the size or three times the size. And you actually can throw them in your garage and bring them back out next season, and they'll do really well. And you can get some really funky foliages with them. So they can make that really, uh, Rita was talking about that architectural foliage. Those are fabulous. Um, and I don't forget every season when it comes to containers. And I'll, I'll do containers. How many seasons do you think you have with containers? Anybody? Four? Anybody do more? Way more, right? I have clients um, that we do 11 different seasons. So if you have a client that has a really small space and you only have so much real estate, um, what we do is we actually switch out. We have liners and we switch them out constantly so they get a constantly different look and they don't become complacent with what they have in their containers. Especially summer, right? Because summer's a very long season. If we just plant something in the beginning of summer, um, you know, it's beautiful and it can do some, some great stuff, but you can get kind of bored with it. So we switch it out. And so I do lots of different seasons. It's a really great way as a landscape designer to be in touch with your clients constantly, being there and making some good money off it too. Uh, this is actually just a little display that I did, but I, I wanted to show it to you because I put uh, lanterns into the planters, and I actually threw in orchids. Has anybody used orchids in summer displays? If you've got a shady garden, and you can, you can actually throw some orchids, keep them in their pots, and put some moss around them, they do fabulously well. I had a client, there were uh, two doctors, and I, I put orchids underneath their maple trees, and they're like, yeah, okay, that's going to be three days. <laughs> I'm going to call her back. The whole summer, just continuous blooms. They were amazed. So they're kind of funky and very, very exotic. I just, one uh, thread of warning is to put it somewhere where maybe you don't have a lot of vandalism because I did do it at one of my clients and um, she told me that a boy down the street took it to give to her mother for Mother's Day. So, <laughs> or his mother for Mother's Day, so you never know. So sculpture. This is not what I think of when I'm specifying <laughs> sculpture to my clients, but... Um, Unfortunately, sometimes this is what happens. Like, I sometimes have to get in there. It's a tricky time to get pictures before, and, you know, the after pictures with clients before they do stuff like this. <laughs> Seriously. But, yeah. The, so, what I usually do with my clients with sculptures, I actually just mark out a spot. You know, this is a great place for a sculpture. Sometimes they want me to help them source it. Sometimes they don't. But really, why I do that is, is sculpture is so personable. And, and you know, our taste really comes into play with artwork. And I actually, I've had a client that I've dealt with them. Um, this is my, uh, we're on our third home that I've done their landscaping for over the course of about 20 years. And I thought I knew them really well. And so I was giving them ideas for sculpture and they started throwing me back other totally in the opposite direction ideas. So you never know what people's tastes are even when you've been working with them a long time. So I kind of leave that to their, their own, um, their own taste accord and, and we find something for them. But I wanted to show you this because I think sometimes when we think of sculpture, we think super expensive, right? Like the last one we saw, which was probably worth about five grand. This is simple. What, we all have something dead growing in our gardens, you know? <laughs> so this is just spray painted red. And then what they, what I love about this too, is see the fence? See what's going on in the fence? There's holes. So that is clever because if there wasn't holes there, that fence would be pretty boring. But with those holes, what it does is lets the light in from another space, and we kind of borrow some ideas there. It's funny. I don't know if you remember the one in Atlanta that we saw. We went to a garden center, and there was a blue tree with leaves growing on it. And I'm like, what's with that? So I said to the owners, I go, see, you thought that was dead, right? And you painted that? And they said, yeah. <laughs> they painted it blue to match their color scheme. And then sure, lo and behold, it actually was still living and then in the spring it leafed out again. So it was a pretty funkin' looking tree. But you know, sometimes it can just be a container, like some really cool container. This is even just this very simple container. But that can create, you know, a, a really neat sense of the garden, that neat kind of sculptural view and, and give it a little bones. Because if that wasn't there, that garden wouldn't be much, right? It would kind of just be this whole meadow, but it just kind of grounds the whole space. 
And here's some lanterns. I have some lanterns in my store. Just funky three different size lanterns put, put in there. Um, a really in, inexpensive way to add a little personality to the space. And here, if you're a maritimer or you love the sea, you know, something like this is kind of neat. And I think women in particular, we've got a lot of women in the room today, um, tend to really are drawn into spheres. I don't know what it is about that spherical thing, but we tend to love them. I think we should do a survey on it, but I, I think I'm right. Do you guys like that, the, the roundness? And it just kind of brings you in. It's all encompassing. But here's a neat thing. It's, it's, it's multi-purpose. It's a, it's a water feature. It's going to give you some nice sound. I love these for my clients, these water features that you can just dump <laughs> and refill because um, they run into a lot of difficulties. We have to get into balancing the pH and the chlorine and everything of the water. This way they can just make sure they fill it. That's the only challenge with these. But just a beautiful piece of sculpture that they can put on your deck. This is actually something I'm working with um, with one of the water artists in, in Toronto. Um, called, his company is called Saline Solutions. And what it is, it's very cool. It's a water, the water floats over that. So, this would be where video would be great, just to show that trickling effect over the water of the plants. And here, you know, sculpture that's functional as well. So kind of funky, a bench. These were very, very expensive. These are um, handbone glass, an exclusive area in Toronto. But I actually saw these at the Perennial Plant Association tour we did in Vancouver this year at Thomas Hobbs, and I bought some. They were only $80. And I mean, yes, they weren't absolutely gobsmackingly as beautiful as this. But what a really nice way to put some light into your garden. Does anybody have glass in their garden? There's something magical about it, isn't it? It just kind of, the light dances off it. If you light them up at night, it's absolutely spectacular. So kind of a neat thing to think about in sculpture. And then it could be something that's another, another functionality, a bird bath. It's, it's pretty, too. Do we have a lot of birders? Do you guys? Yeah, like it's, it's a big thing. I love this. This is sculpture and function. It's, it's actually a, a, a trellis for a, um, an annual vine. But think about what that's going to look like in the winter when that annual vine's no longer there. It's still really pretty. This was at Longwood. Um, it's actually concrete, and it's, it's an oak leaf in the water fountain. I was like, okay, I've got to take a picture of this. This is really awesome. And, you know, there's, again, the personality, if you like it or not. Those are kind of cool. They're about frogs about this size. And uh, wouldn't that be cool by a pond, you know, a whole bunch of them tritzing off? This is actually um, in the Bridal Path. This is quite a quite exclusive area in Toronto. And... That is meant to look like water, like a sculpture of water. But when you look at it closely, it's actually rocks that have all been pl carefully placed. Now, that's a maintenance company that did that. <laughs> no wonder why, right? Because maintaining that would be crazy, right? My, my city guys over there, would you like to maintain that? Not so much, right? <laughs> so the other thing you can do in small gardens is those little tiny details that would be totally lost in those big, expansive spaces. But just look at the little details on that stairway with the, the, the corners all um, beveled off. I love these stairs because stairs can sometimes feel very oppressive. And just by taking that little setback underneath there makes those stairs a lot more appealing, a lot more comfortable to, to go up. I noticed the stairs here, by the way. Does anybody know what's wrong with those stairs going up to here? No. There is too many of them, but the reason is, is because they're too shallow for the, the, the depth of the tread. So the shorter the, the height of the tread, the longer the depth should be. So that's why they're a little awkward. But yeah, you're right, they're too many because of that. There's my little tip for the day. But you know, you can get more expensive stone. Like that's what I like about doing those small spaces because what does it matter if it's $10 a square foot or $20 a square foot when you're only doing a couple hundred square feet? It's not that big of a deal because the labor is so much more but you can get really beautiful stone. This is um, laser cut. Do you guys do laser cutting here? It's a beautiful effect, and it really kind of shows almost like a fossilization of the stone. It's super, super smooth, too. And then using plants as sculpture is really kind of fun. Um, and we can, I mean, the possibilities are endless. If you ever have gone to Vancouver, there's some crazy <laughs> boulevards where people have done caterpillars and elephants and all kinds of animals. But you, know, you can do something really kind of simple like this, 
or I love this, where it's like knotted, woven in together and, and created a really nice rhythm in your space. And then this is again at Longwood Gardens where you've got the boxwood and you've got the, the barberry together and that knot, knotted effect is just beautiful. And you could really pull that off in a small space. Furniture, I could talk about forever furniture. I sell furniture in my store, it's really kind of fun. It's really something that we forget about um, as landscape designers. And then what happens, which is really why I started getting into it, is my clients would whine and complain about everything I was you know, getting them to buy. And then they turn around and spend fifteen to 20000 on a on furniture sets with their interior designers. And what does that interior designer know about that design? So I've really started to take the, the furniture as well and started to incorporate that into my designs. But you know, picking the furniture, the right furniture, is important too. Especially with small spaces, you don't necessarily want it to be bulky or you don't want it to be the, the starring role. And sometimes you, know, you get out to the store and you buy something that's really showy, but maybe it should be a little more subdued. And this works because the color of it just matches in with the stone and kind of blends. And then the gardens get to play the starring role. This is really funky. Um, I love this. I, I don't know if you guys are doing fire pits or any of that in, um, in Kansas. It's very popular in, in Toronto. It's really extended our seasons. But this is a really awesome idea. It's actually a fire pit inside. Uh, and then you've got a coffee table around it. So it's great for a small space when you want to uh, do double duty. We've got a company in Canada that's making ones that hide the propane tank right in them. So it's really kind of fun. And then, you know, you can add color into furniture in your garden, have some fun with it. Hand-painted furniture really kind of, it's, it's going to be noticed in a small space. And I love this. This is, um, this is a garden we saw actually with the APLD, the Association of Professional Landscape Designers in Ohio. And here, it's just, I love the retro furniture here. It's really kind of fun. And that fireplace is nothing to talk about either. And then here again, it's like sculpture meets functionality with, with um, the benches and, and the stool. Really beautiful pieces, works of art. OK, so let's talk color. I'm passionate about color. Not so passionate about this. I took this because I think this was from Communities in Bloom Award from uh, England. So I can't offend anybody. It's no one's garden, even here. But it, you know, it, yes, it's, it's like stop your car and look at it, crazy color. But is that the effect we really want to get? Maybe. Maybe that's what you want to get. But a lot of times, I want gardens where I'm going to feel comfortable in, that I want to actually spend some time in. Remember what Rita was talking about at the Atlanta Botanical Garden, the children's garden, and not wanting to be there because it was like hot? Well, would you want to sit there for a little bit? Pretty much, right? It's, it's just so calming. So blues and purples, they recede. So they, they, they go back into the distance. So they actually give us more depth, but they're very easy on the eyes. Here, another garden. This is actually the front of that garden I just showed you with that beautiful fireplace. But just, I mean, there's not a lot of color in this garden, right? It's just whites, and then the beautiful foliage is the blues and the greens, and they just play, play off each other beautifully. And you just want to be in that space and spend some time in that space. And I think with our lifestyle being so crazy, you know, everything's bombarded us. We're at this super speed that we actually, we actually get home. We actually should be sitting in our garden and just like zenning out and, and, and being calm and not like wanting to look at everything all over the place. And I can't reiterate enough as much as what Rita talked about, the foliages, they're, su they, they're the superstars of the garden. And if we look at the, the flowers as, you know, that you know, punch that's the added bonus, but the foliages is what we should be thinking about with the designing. Here, I just love it with the painted Japanese fern and the sweet woodruff, the contrast in the shiny foliages and, and the texture is just a, is a winning combination. And again, here you've got the a carex and a hosta, um, just really kind of pretty. And this is again another one from Longwood, and I pulled this out because I just love that color connection again. You've got that little bit of plum in, in, the, in the planting beds and that annual beds, and then you've got that threading in the banana leaves, that, that same continuity there. So it's a really neat space. And I actually just stood looking over this space for probably a half an hour. I just was mesmerized by it. And sorry, this is a little out of focus, but I just love this picture with the agaves 
and the beautiful lime um, coleus just lining down there. And I just think it's just such a, I just, I'm just sucked in there. I just want to go and skip down that laneway. I would too, but believe it or not. And there again, we got the blues. And then that color connection with the blues and the blue in the pots. It's just really fun. And you know, painting on, on the furniture too and the shutters, you know, you can you can tie that in. A lot of times I'm always giving advice to my clients about the facades of their homes as well, not just the landscape, but how they can tie it all together. So it's kind of nice to have that continuity of color with the, the delphiniums and then that tying in, in the blue shutters. And then here's what not to do, right? Like, do you want to spend time in the space? Yeah, it's pretty but I don't want to spend any time in that space. It's too busy. There's too much going on in my eye. I don't know about you, but when you're looking at that slide, is your eye all over the place? Right? It's like <laughs> So that's better. Oh. For my display gardens, uh, chocolate chip ajuga. It's really funky ajuga. You should try it out. It's really neat little texture too for a small garden. And alliums. Are you guys into alliums? We're like crazy about alliums. Um, one of our plant gurus up north, well, uh, Paul Zamet, was talking about Millennium. If you can get a hold of that one, it's just a, a superstar. It's a little allium. And then I was thinking about you guys when I was pulling up this slide this morning to look at it. Um, do you guys grow blue globe spruce? I, I think with your landscape, especially right now with all those plummy, natural plummy colors, what a fabulous juxtaposition in color like really great punchy color that you can look at. How long is your winter here? You go from six months. So you're about as long as us, but not as bad as us. <laughs> so, you know, you gotta think about that, right? We have to think about those six months of nothingness, right? You guys, my son, when we flew in, he's like, it's brown here. <laughs> I said to him, I go, it'd be brown in Canada too if we didn't have white snow. <laughs> it's brown grass underneath. So, you know, we have to really think about those color combinations of what it looks like in the fall and winter and early spring. And, you know, playing up those colors could be really fun. And this is actually taken from New York. So color, you know, foliage is king. This, these are big, huge planters on the streets, but it's just the foliages and the combinations together are really fun. So I pulled out a few uh, plants that I think you have to have in a small space. Um, this one's a stilby, but it's called Sprite. Do you guys grow a stilby here? Yeah. yeah, so this is my absolute favorite of stilby, and I'll tell you why. When it's not blooming, the foliage is it's a little tiny fern-like foliage, glossy, glossy leaves, and then the pink is just a blush. Like, it's just barely pink. It's just like a little, little blush of pink on it. Stunning plant, and it's a fairly long bloomer. And it will tolerate a little bit more sun than the average is still be. Carex. Um, this one is, oh my goodness, uh, Toffee Twist. And so I don't know if you guys need these. You have a lot of this color naturally in your space. But um, it's really funny when that was first introduced. A lot of my clients thought I was planting a dead plant in their space. But when you put that with the greens, what a great color combination. And they become come alive, both of them. Virginia is a really great one for dry shade, so that's kind of a weird combination, dry and shade. Um, but I love it because the foliage stays year-round. So when you guys don't have snow, which I think you guys don't have snow a lot in the winter, is fabulous. And this one is Bressingham Ruby, which the foliage turns that plummy color. Fabulous. And it makes a great cut flower, really beautiful cut flower that lasts for weeks in a, in a vase. And this one's a newer variety called Lunar Glow which is kind of funky if you want that chartreuse in a, in a, a cool, uh, shady spot. Lunar glow. Lunar, like the, the moon. Anybody know this one? It's Roseanne, which is the perennial of the millennium. Not the year, not the decade, not the century, the millennium. Um, Chelsea Flower Show just named that last year um, with their anniversary. It is a non-stop show stopper. It, um, it'll bloom from June to October. You can cut it back and it just goes and goes and goes. So I always tell, I have clients that, I don't want annuals. Well, I'll give them this because I know it's going to give them tons and tons of floral display. Euphorbia, they're kind of fun with the foliages. Uh, Helleborus, they've really come a long way in the breeding of them. Um, 
Helleborus is all, they've always been a beautiful flower and a beautiful foliage, but the problem with the flowers, the older varieties, is the blooms were down here, so you were good if you were six inches high, right, to enjoy them. So now they've been bred to be more upright, and this one is one of my favorites. It's called Ivory Prince, and it comes up that limey green in the spring, and it'll flush out that pink that you see um, as it matures. And I, if I have it in the right spot, so you don't want it in a really hot spot, you want it under a, a tree, it'll bloom. I've had a client where it's bloomed from May to July. So not, not a bad showstopper. And it has great foliages. It's like a leather leaf foliage and it's quite nice on its own. This one, European ginger, just love that shiny glossy leaf. And I love that reflective quality in a small space. I think it adds a little punch and almost like a mirror-like image. So we talked about the painted Japanese fern and there's millions of different varieties now. I can't even keep track of which one's which anymore. And then hookerella. Do you, do you guys grow hookerella? Yeah, so it's great, right? It's, and I, I'm finding, I was talking to one of my growers because I got him to bring in a whole bunch. He goes, I'm not selling these. And like, I don't know why because really it's, it's the best of both worlds, right? You've got the beautiful foliage of a hookerella but you've got the Tirarella bloom, right? So you've got that great fluffy bloom in, in, in contrast. So some really great ones out there. So good for the shade. And this one is my absolute all-time favorite, Hosta, June. I, um, it's, it's just a little tiny one, so it's a really nice one. Because you know sometimes Hostas can get really out of control and take over the garden. So it's a really nice um, one. It has kind of a limey yellow center, and then it has a bluey green banding. And sorry, this one's a little out of focus, but I kind of did it that way on purpose to show you. This is um, salvia. Um, oh my goodness, I forgot. Caradonna is the variety. And what I love about it is that's actually the spent bloom. Not bad, right? That's what it looks like when it's dead, like the bloom's dead. So as it's blue, 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 um, and then when the, the blooms are done, they go this kind of pinky color, pinky purple color. And I just love that. I think it's fabulous in the garden. So this is one of my gardens from Canada Blooms, and actually this was tweeted by Martha Stewart. Woohoo! Um, yeah, that was quite the experience. We'll talk about that another time. I'll have to go through therapy with that. Um, but she really, I think she liked the grapevine balls. But what we tend to do, I think, because we're all plant lovers, and when we have a small space, is we want this, one of this, one of this, one of this, one of this, right? You guys are with me, right? But what we have to do is kind of curb ourselves, and we, we have to stay away from the garden centers. <laughs> Because I think we, we zoom in on that bloom, right? Like, I gotta, I gotta have this again. So um, what you want to do, though, is you want to have mass plantings, even in small spaces, because you want to have an effect. If we have one of this, one of this, and one of this, what happens? I showed you the picture. Your eye's all over the place. So you really want to have some kind of continuity there. Does anybody know why you do three, five, and seven? No one knows? Do you know? Bad luck. <laughs> so a lot of people, oh, it's natural. But what happens when you have three is your eye can't divide it, right? When there's three, it's stronger. When you have four, your eye constantly is dividing that number. So there's another little tip for you for about landscape design. So that's why you get told in any design course that you need to put three blooms in or five blooms in or seven is it's much stronger. So when you are doing these mass plantings is you want to do those numbers as well. Sorry, I don't know why this doesn't want to move. Yeah, it won't move at all. That's why it's good. That's okay. You, Sorry. You keep talking. Do you want me to do a dance? Do, 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 do. Yeah. <laughs> Is everybody tired from lunch? Yeah. Get the lows. Okay. okay. So, vertical gardens. I think someone, I can't remember who was talking about that today already. Um, actually, a few probably. Um, but when a small space, when you're limited with that real estate, vertical gardens can be great. You guys probably have the same problem I have, is, is our climates are so extreme, right? We get that really hot summer and then that cold winter. So vertical gardens, we're going to have to be really cognizant of, A, where we put them. So we don't want those northwest facing walls. We want a nice protected wall, probably a southern exposure. Uh, protected, though, from that wind, because the wind's going to dry out a vertical wall. But what I've been doing, I've actually been working on it for about five years now with one of my growers, 
is we've designed these um, pitchers that hang on the wall. So they go up for three seasons, and then you either lay them down in a bed for the winter, or you throw them in the garage and forget about them until the spring, and then put them back up. But that's kind of a neat way of introducing more um, into the garden. This one's actually, we were just talking about this last night, Flora Grubb. Google her. She's really, really cool. And she's from San Francisco. This is her wall at her store. Um, but it's kind of that concept of having that living artwork on the wall. That's all succulents, by the way. And that, but you can do it. You know, it doesn't have to be really extravagant. You can see a lot of the kits that are coming out now um, doing vertical vegetable gardens. And then here's one on a shoestring budget. Ha, 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 ha. You know, done it on a shoe bag. So, simple, simple. And then I think at lunchtime you, uh, we were talking about espaliers. I don't know why the growers aren't doing more of this, that we can just buy them done and just stick them on the wall. But I think it's a fabulous way of growing our fruit. And, and I was talking to, like, a lot of young people really, you know, growing vegetables is the future. And that's the way we're going to engage them in gardening. And this could be a really great way of doing it with espaliers. This one was from the Atlanta Botan Botanical Gardens. If you ever go there, they have a fabulous edible garden. It's, it's really, really well done. It's probably the best one I've seen yet. This is a living wall that we did for a display at Canada Blooms. Definitely not sustainable. We just kind of threw plants in, but it's just kind of the concept. And this was very, when it was very, very new, it was a new thing. But this one is at Longwood. This is the most beautiful corridor of bathrooms you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> just like skip down there going, life is wonderful. And it's just the, that the air that you breathe when you walk down that space is just fabulous. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, Roger Chance, he actually uh, wrote a really great article in our trade magazine. He, he spent a month there and um, was talking about how this, it was just being launched when he was there, so I was so envious of that. And this is actually just another living wall, but it's plants. It's done in a kind of a neat plant stand. So again, it's not maybe sustainable for um, a residential purpose, but it's kind of neat for a, a public space. Pull this one out because I think it's kind of important. This is one, one of ours from the Awards of Excellence. But the fence here, like it's, you know, it's quite busy. But I think how it works is because it's, it's all the same material, right? That same color palette with the, that shed, with the fence, and with the furniture, and so that it all works. If those were all different, I think our minds would go mad looking at that. But I think it works that way. And I love, if you look at the fence detailing, you know, that open airiness, it still gives us that privacy without just closing us in entirely. I don't know if you guys are doing contemporary gardens here, but they're huge, huge, huge. Oh, what happened there? There he is. Um, they're really big in, in Toronto. And so what I like about this is, is really taking note from the architecture. So the siding of the home and then continuing that with the, um, the, the fencing. And I love that banding. So if you run the fence boards this way, would have been a totally different effect. By running them horizontally, it expands the space, makes it look a lot bigger than it is, and it does give us that modern look. This, um, I didn't think I had hoped for this. I saw this idea years and years and years ago from California, the idea of planting up the middle of your driveway with some neat plants, you know, probably tough, drought-tolerant plants. Well, I had hope. I went to Ohio and I saw it there with a landscape designer there did it. So I was like, okay, we can do it in, in Toronto. So maybe not where you would plant, you know, park your car constantly, but maybe a spot where it's like a secondary spot where you have guests that will drive over top of it. But what a really awesome way to treat your driveway. There's a view from the road. Isn't that great? And all that, you can tell that person loves plants. And I love this. You can't see it that well, but instead of, I think a lot of times our approach to, you know, if we have to have a retaining wall, let, you know, square it off. And I think partly because the contractors, it's just easier, right, for them to square off that wall. But instead of squaring off that corner, they've done two pillars and then a beautiful curved part. And that totally changes that impression of that little small space. If that came out to the corner, you know how that driveway would feel? You'd be like wanting to suck your breath in every time you pulled in the driveway. But having that little cutout makes a huge difference in that feel of that front driveway. There's a, a little closer picture of it. 
And then here, we're doing this a lot in, in Toronto, is reclaiming that driveway, that back part of the driveway to the backyard. A lot of our clients, their cars are too big to actually go through those small spaces between the two houses. So they're actually reclaiming it. They're making space where they put gardens and, and patios in. And there's another example there. And it's kind of neat. You could put things, I do some things with some of my clients. We actually put planters on rollers. So they can park a car there if they want to, but most of the time when they don't need to, we have the planters out and, and we have some neat space. We can actually use planters to make some great room dividers or some privacy screens from our neighbors and have some really great parties in that space. I'm just going to skip over that. Um, so, you know, using, we talked a little bit just quickly about that banding with the fences. You can do that with, with, with patios as well. So here you've done this really neat banding and then interject some plant material in between. We're doing a lot of that in Toronto. But what that does is, I don't know about you, I haven't had a chance to drive around your neighborhoods to see what your houses are like. But we have a lot of houses in Toronto, they're very tall and thin, really limited space. So we want to expand that profile, make it look like it's bigger than it is and a little wider than it is. And this is a great way to achieve that. Even if you do have a, a nice wide area, it's even nice, nicer to enhance it that way. And this here, so you know, taking off and doing some neat uh, brick banding into the lawn, or this is actually probably a steppable in this case, is kind of a neat effect and, and something you can do in a, in a small space. And uh, we're doing lots of different um, Paver, paver treatments in, uh, in Ontario. Here we've made almost like a rug-like approach with um, contrasting brick, uh, really kind of makes a neat space. Another one with that idea. And I love this one because it actually shows you the different grade changes so that you can um, negotiate all the, the changes and steps. This is one of my projects, um, and what I did here is I did this, the stone on a diagonal. I, I changed it up, but we use the same stone. We just use different sizes, so it can really give you, you know, change and, and make a nice transition between spaces without um, making it look smaller. Because if I had taken and put in a whole different material in that circle, it would really make that space look a lot smaller than it really is, like that kind of circle. I think if I gave that to my contractors, they might want to shoot me. <laughs> yeah, because it would be a lot, a lot of cuts. But sometimes those little details can make a huge effect on a space. So sometimes it's worth it. And you really have to weigh the pros and cons because it's going to cost a lot more. It's probably, um, probably at least 30% more material. So sometimes you have to really make sure it's, it's going to give you that effect you want. Sometimes I find the driveways can be super busy because you know, someone gets super crazy with the designs, and sometimes that's not necessarily what we want to do is totally be focused on a driveway. Kind of a neat approach to a, a front yard. And that diagonal and that in and out zigzag really changes how that space is and makes it look a lot bigger than it really is. And again, here, that diagonal takes 10% more stone to do diagonal work. Um, but it can really expand the space and make it appear a lot larger. I like this. I wanted to show you this because it works. You've got all these different types of stone. You've got, you know, a random flag. You've got the different dry laid um, or wet laid retaining wall, and then you've got the, um, you know, uh, the, the bonded stone there, and then you've got slabs of it. Why it works is the stones all from the same place. And so even though they're all different stones and different patterns, they work because they have that same common color palette. And the one thing I can suggest to you guys is, you have beautiful stone here, by the way. I have noticed that, is use your stone from your area. Nothing more frightful <laughs> is I find that my clients will buy stone from Quebec, the province of Quebec. And their stone's white. And it looks like it's been plopped down from the moon when it lands in Ontario. It just does not go well. Like it just, it's this weird, like what's that doing there? And I've actually been known, believe it or not, to stain that like stone when I can't get rid of it. I've actually gone out with concrete stain and toned it down or dirtied it up because it just looks so funny in our space. So we do have to look for stone that's indigenous to our area. 
Um, I don't know if you guys are bringing in stone from India. We are because it's so much cheaper. So when I do have to go that route, I am picking for stone that looks really similar to the stone that's natural in, in the area that I'm working in. I just pulled this out because this is actually at a, a display garden at Canda Blooms. But these little details here, like this little pieces out here, there's no cuts involved. But those little details are neat in a small space that would go unnoticed in a big space. Um, I don't know if you guys have this, but we have a, a mandate for any uh, paver in the front yard in Toronto has to be a permeable paver. Has that, ha that happened here? It's huge in Toronto. We cannot use asphalt anymore. Or what do you guys call asphalt? You call it something weird. Asphalt. You call it asphalt? Okay, because so, somewhere in the States they call it something else. Um, so we can't asphalt our driveways anymore. So if you have an existing driveway, so I have a client that calls me and says, okay, I want to redo my driveway. They cannot asphalt it anymore. We have to use a permeable paver so that the water can filtrate back down and go into the water table and not into Lake Ontario. So it is a good thing, but it, it does, it does um, gives, give us some challenges. But this was when it was first introduced and we had to use these really big voids. Um, but now it's, it's gotten a little better and we've got lots of different options to use. Um, here's another example of that diagonal being used effectively. I had um, this really cool product uh, called Rock Deck on the top, and it was just that much bigger. It was about an inch uh, wider than the, the pieces of stone that I had below, so it really gave us that impression that it was much bigger than it really was, that backyard. This actually um, was from one of our garden tours, and I just love that perspective that that um, gives us with the stonework going into that um, statue. And this, uh, actually, Rita showed those planters, so I'm glad she didn't talk about the pavers. <laughs> um, but that is a side yard. That was us going down a side yard to see the, to the back of the house. And by putting those stones on the diagonal totally transforms how big that space appears. Because if those stones were put just rectilinear, just parallel to the house all the way down, it would seem a lot smaller, wouldn't seem as wide as it is. So it, that's a really great trick. So this is a project I did in Toronto, and it's very funny because the house next door, you can see just a little peek of the house next door, it's the exact same house, only just a different color combination. And every time I go by this house, there's people and they walk and they look at the house that I did, and then they look at the house beside it. And they look at the house that I did, and they look at the house beside it. And they can't figure out what's going on. It looks so much bigger, this house. Like the, the, the landscape looks so much bigger than the house beside. But it's all these optical illusions that I've done. So I've done that diagonal that I've talked about. I've done a banding that's gone across. See that horizontal banding? And what that does is it expands the space and makes it appear a lot larger. We've done the mass planting. You know, we, and we've played up with our, our levels there. And the difference between the two houses is, is night and day because of that, just those little tricks you can do to make a space seem a lot larger than it really is. And doing things on a herringbone, that's a really great way to expand the space as well. So instead of another alternative to doing a diagonal. This one here is a, a deck that I love the deck detail. Did anybody notice what's happening there? You've got a thicker board and a thinner board. Thicker board, thinner board. Really neat way to jazz up a deck and really doesn't cost us that much more. You just have to watch when you're building it to make sure you've got the, the joists in the right place. And here you've got all kinds of different materials, but you've got that continuity with the materials. And so your eye follows through with the neat patterns that you've got, but it's, it, there's something that just unifies the space, and it's really quite interesting. Love this. This was in a really, this lady was really quite extensive. She had this beautiful estate on o Ohio. And I think she actually kept on giving projects to the landscape company because I think she just liked them there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think she was a, lo a lonely widow. But this was a really cool idea, just almost like a puzzle piece. Like you want to just grab those those stones and put them back into the walkway. But what it does is it brings your eye and you want to go into that space. It just draws you into that pathway. Pools are huge in, in Canada. I've, in the last five years, I've done more pools than I've done my whole career. Um, but pools, instead of doing that concrete pad around the outside, that three-foot pad around the outside, think about it with the backdrop. They, why do they have to have a pad going all the way around? Could we not have this beautiful oasis, lush oasis in the background, and then the foreground is that beautiful pool, and you can come in and entry that way? 
And there's another one there. This is actually a friend of mine's, um, his client space. But really, really neat that that plant bed is right up to the pool. I have to fight my clients to do this, but when we actually win, it's it, it's really fabulous effect. And using a pool, this is like a plunge pool. You, you, you jump in, but it's also a reflecting pond. So it acts double duty. It's something pretty to look at in, in the garden, but it's also something, a, a beautiful pool as well. Um, you know, putting chandeliers in gardens and doing really different things we can get away with in small spaces. This is really neat. This was done by the, the college that I teach at, Humber College. If you look at the right, that backdrop, that's actually a mural that's been painted. And it's very clever because they've painted it so that the stones continue on. They've even repeated the plant material that's in the foreground of the garden. So that could be a really clever way in a small space to really expand the space. Great job she did. That was an, the, one of the students actually that painted that. Uh, railings, um, you know, you can do big chunky railings, but sometimes in a small space it's important to think about um, how you approach that. This is a great railing here. It, it would not work if that was a big painted chunky wrought iron railing, right? Because that space is so tiny, but by using that brushed steel, or actually a stainless steel by the way, um, it recedes, right? It just kind of fades out into that gray stone and, and it, it appears a lot larger than it is. We're having um, an issue in Canada. We actually have to have a pool enclosure. We can't use our house any longer as part of the enclosure to our pool. Do you have that too? So uh, this is a really clever space that one of my friends did. Um, beautiful, lightweight, wrought iron, glass. And it almost, when you're actually there, it just kind of disappears and you really get to appreciate the pool area and the garden space. What's the blue? Oh, that is a stunning um, sculpture, blue uh, glass sculpture. Applying with lots of money. Really funky. I mean, in little small spaces, you can add that artistic approach. And here's a beautiful finial on top of a, of a fence. This is a garden that I did at Canada Blooms. And again, it's that idea of mass planting with the, um, the dogwoods. Mirror in the garden is fabulous in a small space. It really reflects. This one I did in a container. And uh, it's very hard to take a picture of a mirror without being in it. But um, you know, doing different things with mirrors in, in the garden. And I've actually put them outside of my store. And I can't keep them on the wall. I keep on selling them. People love them. And they just they bounce the light off. And they really transform a space. And if you have a really boring, dull wall, wow. Like that is an instant lift, like a retrofit. This is kind of fun. This is a stainless steel water feature, water weir. And again, it's, it's adding that light into a small space, especially if you have a dark corner. This is a backyard I did. Um, it's not small, but we had a very limited depth to it. Um, and you can see I had some challenges with the backdrop. That's what I had to deal with, many different um, fencing materials and ugly views. And so this is what I did right against the back of the space. I wouldn't use that again, by the way. That silver brocade artemisia is, is really um, weeded itself out. but. Um, definitely probably just a regular artemisia. And then here what I did is I did a pergola, a curved pergola in the back. And um, it was quite interesting because it took us two months, months to get the pergola built. So they, they lived with the patio for two months in the summer before that pergola was built. And I really had to push my client to get that pergola and they, because it was a, a pretty good ticket item. But it was interesting because when we actually went in, they went, oh, OK, I get it. Like, it totally changed that backyard. It grounded their space. It gave them a sense of enclosure. And then it really distracted their eye from what was happening in behind. I'll just take, there's what I did. I stained it out to match the house. And so it just looks like it's been there forever. And there's that same kind of idea with a front yard. You know, so it's got that open lattice. They've stained the, the front fence to match the cute um, architecture on the home. And it really works. So it, you know, it, it, it doesn't look like there's two different spaces there. How are we doing? Do I have five more minutes? Yeah, sure. OK. Um, this is a space in Toronto that's, uh, it was a subdivision built in the um, racetrack area. And so it's just all these really cute row houses on top of row houses on top of row houses. They're very tall. Like they're, I think they're four stories tall. So everybody's looking into each other's little postage stamps of backyards. So this is quite clever here with their, this is actually a hot tub, a beautiful little hot tub. But they've put a, a nice pergola over top. So when you get in it, you don't 
you know, when you're in your bathing suit, you de definitely don't want to be seen by everybody. So it gives them that sense of enclosure and, and gives a little bit of a buffer from everybody looking in on their backyard. This is a little side yard I did for one of my clients. And that curving space, um, either being curvilinear or that undulating space, so it could be a rectilinear design as well, really changes how that space appears. It would, if I had just done these two narrow beds against the, the fence and the house, that space, you could see it all in one minute, and it would seem a lot, believe it or not, a lot smaller. What happens is your eye, it takes you longer to look along that curved walk, and so it actually appears bigger. So it's an op optical illusion. This was um, their backyard before we put the planting in, and this is what it would look like after. Again, it was that mistake with that silver brocade. <laughs> Another view. And this was a really fun space I did. Um, tiny little front yard. Um, their, their home backs onto a ravine. So their only space for sunshine was the front. And these clients like to drink wine. And they like to have wine and cheese in the, in the evenings, but they didn't necessarily want to invite the whole neighborhood every night. So we had to create a space in their front yard for them to sit and enjoy their wine without being totally exposed to the whole neighborhood. So what I did is I built these um, wrought iron trees. So in the winter, they're kind of cool. We grew silver lace vine up them. So in the, in the summer, they fill in, and they're really full, kind of foliage trees. It gives them a sense of enclosure. And then we've got the ewes in behind. And then in the front, you've got a whole backdrop of, of flowers. So it worked really well. It doesn't look like a fence and blocking, you know, I don't want to see you and stay out of my way kind of thing. But it also does give you that seclusion and, and able to kind of hard at, hide out in your own space. And that's the front view. And then this was a garden I did. Um, for, I met, it was mentioned in the introduction for uh, Make-A-Wish. It was a little girl with cancer. and this. Uh, this was the before. Um, and this deck was falling apart. I can't believe it. The, anybody here that's in construction, the joists were four feet apart. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of scary. Um, and this is what we did. We built um, a two tier terraces and um, a little uh, laminar going across. And I did a little uh, bridge and, and um, bicycle path for her. And what's really amazing, and this is why I do what I do, is that changed their lives, that garden. We had 100 uh, Landscape Ontario members build that. We had 24 to 26 people a day in that little tiny backyard doing it. Um, when, when she got cancer, her mom said, why us? When we came and built this garden, she said, I can't, like, why us? Like, we're so fortunate. We're friends to this day. And they were the most secluded kind of insular people ever until we built that garden. And now they invite people over all the time. They're friends with their neighbors. And it has totally transformed their lives. So that's what I do what I do, really. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about. I'll just skip over this. So you know, you can create spaces that have neat backdrops and the illusion that there's more going behind. That behind that shrub could be nothing, right? It could be garbage bins. But it's creating that space that there's more going on beyond. Another example. So that's that same kind of concept. You know, and, and, and using things like your gates and, and putting pretty things on them and making them more than they are, making that like a statement at artwork. Funky screens, I could talk all day about really cool screens. This was, I have to talk about this for one quick second. Curvilinear walls are fabulous. And I had the Dry Stone Wall Association build this for me. And they came up with the idea of doing this on a diagonal. How cool is that? And really neat in a small space. It really adds some punch. I'm just going to flip. And um, I don't know if you guys are using this, but we're using a lot of plexiglass in some of our modern gar gardens with the woodwork. It's really fun. And if those are lit at night, they become really neat light fixtures at night as well wattle fence, pretty easy, inexpensive way to build a fence. And this is really important note, is, is painting out those fences dark colors so that they recede and then they don't play the starring role. Because we don't want our fences to be the end all and be all. We want them to be the backdrop. And so if we paint them out really dark colors, they do go away a little bit. So it's, it's a great idea. It's really hard for me to get my clients to do that. They think I'm whacked when I come out with these you know, charcoal grays and blacks and really dark browns. They're like, oh, I don't know. But when we do get them to do it, it really is effective. 
Do you remember that one? I'm just gonna flip through. Because I know where this one here is neat. Um, you know, doing screens. Here's a planter, but it's got an opening down below where you actually don't need to screen it in. So it gives you that really uh, great illusion that there's more space than there is. Court and steel, we're using a lot of that in, in, uh, in Toronto. It's a, it's a nice way, you don't need the big footprint for the retaining wall, and it's, it's nice and thin, and you can get some really neat retaining wall effects. So that, that's what that is there underneath the blue. Here's a close-up. And again, that idea of doing the banding. This was a horror story, so sometimes less is more. Um, you didn't need all those retaining walls in there, and you didn't need every different material known to man on that, that project. We'll talk about that more tomorrow if you're coming. Um, here, again, it's that idea of having borrowing the space beside you, you know, and letting the light shine through and giving it so it's not a solid wall of brick um, is important. This is a cutout, so you could, you know, if there's a neat spot that you want to cut out and, and have the illusion to look into is, is a really great idea as well. And this I got super excited about and a, a bus tour, and then when I actually got out and saw it, I wasn't too impressed. But the, the concept's really cool, but doing win a window in a hedge can be really neat. And this is a, a water feature I did at a garden many years ago, and it's kind of neat because you got to appreciate the water from both sides. So inside it was, it was, it was quieter, it wasn't, it was more subdued. On the outside it was gushing and really dramatic. A little setback, so instead of doing that wall as a solid wall, doing a cutout and doing some, uh, some um, woodwork there really changes how that space appears. If that space had been all wall, it would be really totally different. And here's a kind of neat before and after. So, you know, again, it's like using all those things about expanding the line across and, and making the profile. I'm getting kicked off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, you want you can come back tomorrow to my workshop and you can see tons more. Yes. <laughs>